And we're back. Welcome to the last hour of our Summer Games, our showcase for 2020. My name is Ayo Backe. I am also one of the teachers of these wonderful people presenting their projects, their uh, game development, and their theory. With me as a co-host, we have tonight Thomas Robert from uh, KDK, who is uh, introducing himself now. And I probably just gave a wrong affiliation for you, didn't I, Thomas? You did, but why not? KDK is a nice place. Hello, I'm Thomas. Uh, I work at the film school, but we are serving the next generation of game developers by offering a 15-week course that runs every after, every autumn with participation of 17 different educations. So, so why not KDK? Um, I have a background in actually making games. I've been doing games for about 20 years. Uh, started out as a designer and writer and producer and later on became more the, the meeting guy that went to meetings and made budgets and stuff like that. I've been both on development side and on uh, the publishing side and my background and something I all love is theater, which I've both been writing and directing. So I have, um, a broad and and uh, nasty background is exactly the man we need for tonight. So thank you, Thomas. Um, we will start right away with our first project. We will have Nikolai Schild Christensen present a project called a virtual playground in space, and uh, it has the the slightly disturbing undertitle "In space, no one can see you play." I'm sure Nikolai will say a lot about that. Please take it away. Yeah, hi, thank you. Hi, uh, yeah, this is our master thesis I've been working on with uh, Adam Wood and Rasmus Odegaard. Uh, and it's about how to make people play without any uh, extrinsic motivation. Uh, so this means that the game should not motivate the player to do anything specific such as missions and quests or gaining rewards or like experience points or high scores at all. Instead, it focuses on intrinsic motivation, uh, which means that the motivation on how to play should come from the players themselves. They should be uh, the ones deciding what to do and what to interact with. Um, so yeah, we are interested in figuring out how to make people play purely for the sake of playing. Um, a, a game like this based on intrinsic motivation, uh, we see essentially as a playground. And here on a playground, there are no specific rules on how to play, and it's up to the player uh, to decide uh, what to do and, and create their own games and figure out what to play uh, by using the toys and objects available at the playground. So this led us to working towards what a playground would be in a virtual space. Uh, so the concept of our prototype is that you play as an astronaut traveling to Mars in a big spaceship. Uh, and the time it takes to travel to Mars is uh, over 200 days. So the player is stuck on this spaceship for 200 real-time days um, and just needs to figure out to pass the time before reaching Mars. Um, so this is just the setting. Uh, the spaceship is the player's playground and is filled with rooms and toys uh, to interact with and play with. Um, yeah, so there's no end goal, there's no rewards you gain by doing anything. It's just purely for your own uh, yeah, benefits, uh, for the experience. Um, the rooms and the spaceship and toys are designed specifically to spark exploration, uh, chaotic and, and creative moments for the player, uh, using concepts from both play theory and analysis that we made of games with play -like, uh, playground-like features such as uh, Minecraft and uh, Octodad and things like this. Um, we think that designing for play in other ways than through ex uh, extrinsic motivation can add a lot to a game and digital applications in general. And letting players decide their own goals and what to do uh, can lead to very meaningful experiences, we think. Um, so therefore our thesis seek out to define uh, heuristics for designing a virtual playground uh, and by this, we're not saying that games should not have missions or rewards or anything like that at all, but play like this uh, with intrinsic motivation is a powerful element uh, that can add a lot to the overall interactions of any game. Uh, yeah, on a last note, it should, uh, I should state that we are in very early phases of the prototype development, so it's still a work in progress, but 
Yeah, we have a short trailer uh, like film that uh, we will show. If I can figure out how to share screen, I do this. Mm. Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine run. given the scientific knowledge, the technical ability, and the materials to pursue the exploration of the universe. To ignore these great resources would be a corruption of a God-given ability. Nikolai. That was exciting and uh, only slightly uh, nausea inducing in VR, I assume. Um, Thomas, please. Thank you, Nikolai. That was a great uh, presentation. And uh, I, I, I would say I wished you had started with showing the video first. So I got kind of a framework to understand all the words. I think as a general rule, when you meet publishers and people with very narrow mindsets and narrow time slots, you always go for the kill first. And I think even though it was an early prototype, you had a lot of good stuff and you also had the, uh, the, uh, the courage to combine it with a, a launch of a rocket while we sort of cut between the launch and, and what happens inside the um, the mothership. That was fun. Um, I'm, I'm, I think, I think one of the beauty things with with the university and the game, game, um, game educations at ITU, and I have the the pleasure and the, the privilege of following it as part of the employers panel. I think one of the beauties is that you can combine a very, you know, low low, as a practical uh, how to make games, uh, bolt and nuts. And at the other end, you can sort of move into completely thinking about what does get the word game means and, and sort of kind of speculate and, and evolve in, in deep thoughts, which I think enriches uh, uh, also even the, the popular products that sells a lot of copies. I think there's an ecology we sometimes forget that, that these, these kind of basic questions are really super important to ask. And, and for that, you, I, 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 I think it could be interesting to sort of push the prototype to the to the finality of your questions because i think you asked a great question i'm not sure you had 
any answers yet. I, I didn't, I sort of looked for what did he say? What, what was your learning? And, and I wasn't really sure what the learning was. Um, let, let me put a little bit closer question and then we can discuss what it is. Um, you said you had these no rules, no goals, and, and there's a kind of, it, it has its own meaning, it becomes meaningful. And, and now we talk about sort of the basics. What do you mean by meaningful and how long does it stay meaningful? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if there's an answer to how long it, it stays meaningful. Um, our research uh, in our thesis just shows that if you participate in, in challenges that you have created yourself, uh, and, and create stuff from your own ideas and mind, um, these experiences will mean more to you, will have a, you will have a greater relationship with that space and that environment uh, than if you're told what to do all the time uh, by the game. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but that is what we are. Uh, how, do, how do you know it creates that meaningfulness? Yeah, I guess we don't know that uh, through our uh, prototype yet, uh, as we haven't done any testing. But uh, yeah, as, as I said, that we have researched some articles and literature that, that have tested stuff about um, people set in environments and, and trying to um, create a pinhole camera, for example, and, and setting up that challenge to create a pinhole camera and going out in their neighborhood and taking pictures and, and seeing the environment in a new way and creating a challenge for themselves but like that um, creates it makes them see their environment in a whole new way and, and makes them have an, another relationship with that uh, environment mm. as an example i, I you know I, i'm i've been zigzagging between uh, you know written theater is very sort of like chronologically ordered and I think this sort of it reminds me a little bit of some of the Dadaistic movements pl playing around with showing, you know, order is not important. We could just throw everything in in any order we want, and something creates something happens. And I think as a kind of a, a motivation for doing artistic work and thinking laterally, it's a, it's a great thing. I, I'm I'm curious about the time aspect because you said it spends 200 days in in space, and I'm just thinking, when do you need this? You know this this uh, the God look in sort of, sort of more, uh, but basically on not as much as the gold, but more on the challenges and 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 the things, the combinations with uh, you feel you have to live up to more and more. That's my question. I think that could be super interesting to to follow up with. How do you measure it? Actually, I was part of of a, a test system about arousal and game satisfaction, and we had doctors and tons of people. And you know what I learned from that is it is really really hard to define in in a kind of a scientific objective manner. So I'm 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 super interested because I think making games we're basically dealing not with people's money but with their lifetime. And and that sort of creates a little bit more. Uh, okay, it actually means something what I do because lifetime you can't buy. Thank you very much. It's a great project. Yeah. I think this was entertaining. I think there was also more of a of a co of a comment than a question at the end from Thomas. Thanks again, Nikolai. It was a really fascinating project, and it it actually makes it really easy for me to transition from this project to the next one. Not only because Nikolai has his fingers in both of them, but also because both pose I think that question that Thomas also pointed his finger at, namely, what do we actually call a game? What is play? And uh, now we had something just now that was kind of designed as a virtual playground. And what we're going to have next is uh, called a play machine. Amduat, a play machine, um, a software developed for a conjunction with a theater project. And uh, Lucas is going to tell us more about that. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. And nice to see you, Thomas. Uh, well, as you just said, I represent a team of, uh, of six people. Uh, of whom Nikolai was one and uh, four others. Um, and uh, let's just do, let the video do the talking. And here it is. <laughs>
Vi er to ud af Tekstmandshold, som har lavet et spil til Hotel Performa. De har en opsætning i 2020 her, der hedder Amduat en ildmaskine. Vores spil hedder Amduat en spilmaskine. En spilmaskine er en uh, interaktiv spiloplevelse, der kan spilles gennem uh, ens browser, uh, hvor man ligesom går igennem de her 12 timer af myten uh, Amduat. Det foregår sådan, at de her 12 timer de bliver spillet igennem, at man bruger sit touchpad til at scrolle op og ned. De her 12 timer er ligesom bygget op som 12 forskellige minigames, der ligesom fortæller en lille bid af det her, den her større historie om Solen Gud Ra og hans rejse gennem underverdenen. Det visuelle udtryk i Amduat-spillet er inspireret af Hotel Performers måde at arbejde visuelt på. Derudover er det inspireret af det egyptiske billedsprog, men det var vigtigt for os at lave vores egen visuel identitet til spillet, følte vi, som også var anderledes end forestillingen bliver, ligesom at lyden er anderledes end forestillingen. Historiemæssigt er der nogle lidt øh, forskellige omstændigheder, som gør, at vores øh, spil øh, indholdsmæssigt øh, vil virke øh, anderledes end øh, selve opsætningen på Telefoma. Øh, hvor deres opsætning er en versionering af Harald Wodbands bog, øh, er vores mere en, øh, et indblik i mytologien. Eftersom der historisk set har været mange forskellige udgaver af Amduat Myten, er det vigtigt at sige, at vores er en kreativ fortolkning og en versionering, som har været et forsøg på at ramme stemningen af myten mere end de historiske fakta. Hvis man har lyst til at spille Amduat en spilmaskine, kan det, kan det spilles gennem Hotel Performers hjemmeside.
Yeah, that was it. Sorry for just uh, accidentally showing my naked daughter in the background. That wasn't, <laughs> wasn't the intention. Thank you very much. I think it was uh, super cool uh, and nice with uh, sort of the journey into the sun in the end. Uh, very mythic. Um, it, it's it's interesting with these projects. I'm, I'm, I, I have a few questions I would like because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much love it and I could see Adam's uh, touch also to this stuff. Um, there, there are certain elements, but let me start with the more broad ones. You, you especially talked about it has a relationship to the theatrical experience that's going to play, and you can actually meet this product on the platform, the browser at the performance homepage. But at the same time, you say it doesn't follow the performance in either uh, visuals or in in um, uh, or in sound. My my question is how how do you determine when the difference is enough to be actually interesting, but not so far that it's sort of lost connection. You understand what I mean? And I understand sure. performance is sort of in development all the time as a natural living thing. So I understand you need to make some decisions, but, but the whole question about to decide, we want to be different. How do we decide that? For sure, there are many, uh, many layers to this production scene, uh, seen as an overall thing. Um, Hotel Performance performance will base itself, as we say in the video, on Hal Wodman's book by the same name, which is a dual narrative book. It takes place uh, at the bedside of his father at a hospital uh, uh, while he's dying. And meanwhile, it sort of digresses into these uh, comparisons or reflections uh, into the Amduat myth, but it's very poetically written. So the narrative of that book is very different from uh, from our game and the production from what we've seen so far. And then our game differs from uh, from the production in the way that seeing as the, the performance itself of Hotel Performer will try to mirror the dual narrative of that book. For instance, they will have uh, the traditional uh, theater uh, stage. They will flip around so that you will sit on the uh, on the long end and the, the stage will be twice as long or thrice as long. Um, and then they'll have two scenes, one one in front of the other, uh, mirroring uh, the two narratives. So you will have the hospital narrative, I believe, uh, in front, and the and the mythological one in the background. You'll also have two different uh, soundscapes for those two worlds. So they're and then, echoing each other like this, you could say. Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah, pulsating between each other. I, I mm. believe. Mm. Um, and and seeing as. Uh, seeing as the only really real objective we got from them was to to perhaps if we wanted to uh, dive into the mythological aspect more uh, sort of sh shedding away uh, this uh, hospital narrative and diving more into the to the uh, mood and atmosphere of the uh, of the myth that's what we went for and therefore you can also play it before or after because uh, it's not it's not in any chrono uh, chronological order with the performance mm. It's interesting, a lot of the myths can actually be brought up into separate pieces that sort of can be used in other places as well. Sure. I've, I also had a laugh when you said that the myth and the historical facts, I mean, it, the reason why it's a myth is because it's not historical facts. Sure, but, it's yeah. fun. but I guess that's a lot of um, sculptures and, and iconography uh, of, of, uh, of Ra's travel. Yeah, I mean, but you know- In the Book of the Dead, right? What's that, sorry? It's also from the Book of the Dead? Yeah, I believe that's that's its other name, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, there's a question because I could see the journey thing that you're always journeying from left to right. Do you yeah. ever break that uh, axis of uh, viewing? Uh, no. There are points at, at, or there are hours slash mini games in which we, we don't have uh, the, journey. Uh, the journey itself, but we have standstill mini games or for okay. instance killing the, the large snake called a pupis <clears throat> did you as a fine question uh did you test it on on people who were uh, sort of like innocent people who know nothing and what did they uh, get from the experience yes we did that was part of it uh, seeing as one of the first things we established with hotel performer was that we were making a game uh, for non-gamers uh, for theater people who might try out this thing. 
so we wanted to see how it was perceived uh, from from that uh, you can't call it an objective but you know what i mean from that distant perspective of seeing something from the first time and interacting with it and what we focused on in order to assess whether we we found the core of the myth was uh, a term uh, uh, called stimmung, the German word for uh, mood and atmosphere. In Danish, it's stemming, uh, a musical concept to to sort of uh, talk about the yeah the atmosphere and climate of things. So that's what we asked for when we tested uh, for testers to put into words how they experienced um, yeah the climate and the atmosphere and the general feel of it. It was a vague question, but luckily we got we got the answers we wanted from it. That sounds you watch? wonderful. I think I need to cut you two gentlemen short yeah. here because I get the feeling that if I don't, you're going to talk about this for another couple of hours. And I sure. would love no, to listen to fake that. news, fake news. I know. Thank you so much, Lucas. Yeah, thank you. Um, and with that, we're going to move on to our third project, which takes us from Egyptian myth to Greek philosophy. Sebastian Weichelt is going to talk about a theoretical project about playful practices in ancient Greek philosophy. Sebastian, are you ready? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks very much. Allow me to share my presentation. Hello, everybody, you see everything? Good. So, in this a research paper that I wrote last year, what I was trying to do is essentially to uh, dispel this image of rationality as something cold and distant, and on the other hand, of the image of play as something irrational. And I will uh, uh, take you basically through the most important things that I learned while doing this project. So first of all, what is rationality? That's a very difficult term that I don't want to go into in detail because we'll be sitting here for hours, so I will instead Go to the two characteristics that are common through many definitions. First is logic. It's the philosopher's toolkit that allows us to ensure that our conclusions actually uh, follow from our premises and make sure that our arguments are sound. The other one is a concept of critical think thinking, which is itself very complicated, but the core of critical thinking that I ran with is certain dispositions that a thinker must bring to their thinking for it to count as critical. One is that it's unbiased, that it's open-minded, and that it questions assumption. It very much revolves around the aspect that the thinker must leave their preconceived notions by the door and take the ideas that they consider basically on their own. So, and then on the other hand, we have play. And here we are going to start to see some parallels. First of all, play is enjoyable, okay? It's guided by rules for there's a rationality that's very strongly resembled of logic, and play is often considered to be outside of the ordinary. Like in a football match, it's clearly a demarcated beginning and end, and it's also spatially separated from what's uh, outside the playing field and clearly marked what's inside the playing field. And this is a lead us back to critical thinking, where uh, the thought that is contemplated exists kind of in its own bubble where all preconceived notions are left at the door. And finally, Henriks, uh, I think, he did the nail on the head when he said that play is a laboratory of the possible in which players experiment with things, with the world around them, try things out, see how they work, see how the world responds to their actions. So, and since I'm talking about specific practices in ancient Greek philosophy, let's see how they happened. Uh, what we know about that topic comes through texts, mostly written by Plato and other philosophers and other sophists. And the interesting part for me here is where, like in the story, these discussions that we see happen. Several of them happen during a symposium, with it, which is essentially a dinner party. It's a friendly, warm environment in which people generally try to enjoy themselves. Those are uh, others are just general friendly discussions between well, friends or occasionally rivals, where sometimes people just try to find truth by exchanging arguments. Other times, a uh, rival of Socrates would, for example, try to prove his ideas wrong through his arguments. But that, meet, that kind of meeting is not always required. We have, for example, thought experiments, which are purely mental exercise. They, again, this laboratory of the possible aspect where I have a mental 
an imagined scenario to which certain rules apply based on the imagined scenario and that I play through based on the rules of logic. And this whole Socratic exercise is about asking the question, what if? What if the world were different? What if certain conditions were met? How would the world play out? What should I do in a certain scenario? How should I behave? How would a virtuous person behave? And that's very much the aspect that we keep seeing in the text in Socratic dialogues in the talk that these characters have. But of course, like having a bunch of people in a room with wine at a dinner party doesn't automatically create a Socratic dialogue. That's where the attitude of the thinkers becomes a very important characteristic. Plato himself actually wrote that a thinker, a philosopher must bring the right amount of seriousness to their thinking. If they are too serious about it, they will be stubborn and maintain, and be, be, maintain attachment to their preconceived notion and won't be able to accept any new thoughts. Perhaps the new thoughts don't fit their preconceived notions well enough or seem ridiculous to them and they will be too stubborn to entertain the possibility. Whereas on the other hand, a thinker who isn't serious at all will not have the essentially scientific rigor to give each individual idea the consideration and attention that it deserves and would give up on them prematurely. And on the other note of the um, thinker's attitude, I mentioned before that sometimes speakers or thinkers exchange arguments to reach truth together, and sometimes they just exchange arguments to prove each other wrong. That is the key difference that I'm running here with between philosophy and rhetoric. Philosophy is the practice that Socrates wanted to do and often did, where hey, this is cooperative, we're sitting here together, we are having a talk, none of us know what's right and wrong, what's true and not. So we must do our best to exchange argument, to discard false beliefs and find out what's really real, what's really true. Whereas on the side of the sophists in particular, uh, general kind of opponents of Socrates, they didn't like each other. They were all about the rhetoric, about trying to defeat the other person, about being right. And when you are just trying to be right and you're a sophist and you employ rhetoric rather than philosophy, then what you get is, well, truth doesn't matter anymore. Logical fallacies become tools that you can use if applicable to confuse your opponent, your enemy in that case. And they, the sophists introduce a strongly agonistic characteristic in this dialogue, whereas the Socratics have a very cooperative nature and a very different kind of play in rhetoric the competitive rule-based nature of discussion that logic are far more prevalent. So, and because just having thinkers in the room doesn't automatically create dialogue, it points to this kind of rationality, rationality as a way of looking at the world. Because I perceive something doesn't automatically mean that I wonder how it works and make note to ponder it. This is a specific inquisitiveness that I, I as a philosophical thinker need to take to the world. Whenever I look at something or want to investigate something, I need to have well, basically the will to investigate it, which has again overlap with play, that play is enjoyable. I don't engage in critical thinking if I don't want to. I don't engage in play if I don't want to. And nobody can force me to play in the same manner. Nobody can force me to think critically because it would prevent me from getting into the proper dispositions. Again, like unbiased, open-minded that are required for critical thinking. So what does it matter? Why is any of that relevant like for modern games and game development? Well, I think it's crucial to always expand what we consider, consider play, what we think of when we say play. And in particular, the practices that I uh, examined here, I found that we find a very different verb of playing than we do in many modern games. Uh, because the tradition of game development today has a strong focus on to act on. The player acts on the world, provokes a reaction, and then based on what they perceive, they produce another action on the world. Whereas the play here is, I perceive the world 
and then I think about the world and interact mostly with my own thoughts, with the models, the theoretical models provided by logic and other thinkers. So, and this actually comes into play in world building, in environmental storytelling, all these aspects where the player does not directly act on it, but perceives it and constructs something in their mind based on what they perceive. So kind of like as a closing line, I say games are facilitators and enablers of play. The kind of games we can make are fundamentally limited by how we think about play. The joy of contemplation is no exception to that. So. Thank you, Sebastian. And as it is with philosophy, it of course takes a bit longer to explain those things. So Thomas, can I ask you to keep it to one question maybe? No. I know, I know, please try. Sebastian, uh, you got me completely. I think this is super duper interesting. I've been, lately I've been buying into Plato, which I found incredible boring when I was young. And now I'm aging and, and being, you know, an all time good guy. And I think it's super fantastic reading it. I would, um, I have tons of questions, my friend, because I think you, you are into something that's really, really inter interesting about the whole acting on and, and how do we actually leave space for thinking about. I can say as a dramatist, we have something we use called the vacation from the uh, conflict. Uh, if you think about another uh, great uh, classic uh, Terminator 2, uh, when they're in the desert and, and actually there's 10 minutes with no action and the whole thing is about Schwarzenegger and the boy meeting each other and sort of having time to think about who they are and what they are. If we didn't have that scene and you just saw the film, it will feel like completely idiotic and you don't have the time to actually invest and engage in the characters. And with that, I would, I would also recommend you another thing uh, actually to dive into the, um, not only to uh, Plato, which is writing a little bit later than, than said Socrates, uh, but Socrates was actually best friend with Euripides, who wrote some of the biggest uh, and the greatest plays still. I mean, go and read Medea and, and you'll think that he's, uh, I mean, that's about a woman who, uh, she, I mean, she can kick ass. Uh, and, and another one was Ar Aristophanes, uh, who wrote some comedies where you actually can see the scenes where they meet and talk and yada. And I actually think also Plato have one of his dialogues where uh, Aristophanes, Aristophanes is, is, is discussing and by the, the humorless guy, he wrote all these comedies. He's super duper serious. And later on, I think actually he was part of the team who uh, judged Socrates to, um, to kill himself. So, so you can expand the whole thing. And, and, and why I'm saying this, and now comes the, the punchline, is because drama means uh, action. See you later. I love it. I think that was also more of a comment than a question. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you even more, Sebastian. That was really amazing and exciting. And from there, we're going to something that I know way too well. Uh, I now have the, the real pleasure to introduce a project that I supervised uh, last semester. It's called Relinquish. And it is, uh, if you're familiar with what a roguelike is, well, it's a roguelike backwards. But um, Jeppe will introduce us now to the game, and he can explain that way better than I can. Jeppe, please take it away. Hello. All right. Let me just share my screen. You kind of spoiled a little bit of my presentation here. I'm so sorry. We'll work with it. <laughs> so, well, I guess it's always also spoiled in the description, but <clears throat> cool. Hi, I'm Jeppe, and I'm here to present Relinquish, which is uh, a project that I worked on this semester with my team. Um, Relinquish is kind of a roguelike twin stick dungeon crawler ish game much in the vein of uh contemporary entries in the roguelike genre like uh the binding of isaac or enter the gungeon um and in this game you take on the role of a an adventurer who has recently completed uh an exploration session of his of, of, a, of a new dungeon that he has found and you now at the beginning of the game find yourself on the lowermost floor of this subterranean dungeon or the underground dungeon. Uh, your goal is from this point on to return to the surface, to leave the dungeon, but 
um, the only problem being that the that the dungeon won't allow you to leave until you have returned the items and the, the things that you have taken. Um, so this narrative hook kind of plays into the idea of uh, the twist that our game actually has. Um, you see, in Relinquish, um, one of the design or the most central design tenant that we kind of centered the design around uh, was the idea of playing around with progression systems. Uh, and it's, it's especially the progression systems that we usually see in, in conjunction with the roguelike uh, genre. You see, in regular uh, or in the traditional sense, the progression system has the player grow stronger as they play through the game, as they progress, uh, unlocking new interactions, unlocking new um, strengths, um, and generally <clears throat> expanding the player's possibility space in terms of how they interact. But in Relinquish, uh, we wanted to play around with the idea of the player growing weaker as they progress instead. Um, so that includes taking away certain interactions, making the player weaker, having them shoot, um, like on the shooting mechanic, having, having them shoot uh, shorter, I guess, um, taking away health and that sort of thing. And in the current iteration of the game, this is mostly, this mostly comes in the form of our talent tree, nicely timed, um, which Allow, which is kind of a flip on traditional uh, on the traditional idea of a talent tree, where instead of um, where instead of the player slowly putting skills into individual little pieces that then unlock um, I guess new interactions, instead you have all the t all these skills and you have to give them away as they as they go. So for example, I can remove the explosive damage on my on my bullets, I can remove the fact that they are heat seeking. I can and I can remove and I can, I guess, lower my movement speed. Um, this all plays into the progression in the way that um, these talent points that these talents represent uh, or weight, as we call them, is a requirement to get to the next level. So before the so the the game is split up into these floors, and before the player can go to the next floor, they have to give up a certain amount. Of the talent points that they have that they start off with, um, this of course uh, gradually makes the player a lot weaker, both in terms of the many different, uh, like in, in terms of the many of the three different um, interactions that we already deal with in the talent tree. So we have one for combat, one for health regeneration, one for navigation, um, and you as you gradually progress, you move of course move toward this minimal state um, where the game ends. So the idea is that after you have given up all the weight that you can, you um, uh, that's when the game ends. If you get to the final le level, you get to fight the final boss. Uh, I would have prepared, <laughs> I, it was my intention to prepare a final scene. I kind of closed it that, yeah, before. So I can't show you that. But it, the entire idea would be to, to, to showcase how the difficulty uh, changes without us actually changing the values that every like the specific mechanics that enemies provide for you. So without ch changing the working, uh, the workings of challenges, we can we can we kind of get this cool cool effect where the game actually becomes harder uh, and forces the player into considering new things. Uh, and I think that's all I got. So give me things. <laughs> Thank you, Super Thomas. Please ask Thank you questions. very much. Um, did, did you test the game and what did you find from the testing? Did people, how, how um, I would guess that I would expect some um, frustration and some, some, some uh, people sort of longing for solving it and it just gets worse and worse. So how did people react on that over time? I mean, most of our testing was done, uh, in, like most of our testing was done with the focus of getting the basic mechanics down and get in understanding this this talent tr skill tree that we have built um, in understanding how some certain things uh, in how certain how certain like interactions change the players uh, play styles. So we have this, I shouldn't have stopped sharing my screen, but we have this idea um, where you start off with the ability to shoot in every direction. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the talents that, we, that you can remove is now reducing those directions that, that you can shoot in. So you would lock yourself to an eight-directional grid or a four-directional grid. Um, 
and the so most of the testing was about discovering these things uh, and it was mostly also done on the fellow students of ITU so frustration was replaced with intrigue uh, <laughs> in that sense mm -hmm. but there was definitely some frustration in terms of so certain talents being a lot mm -hmm. more impactful than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking because I know that there are games out there. I forgot the name, but that's one where you're sort of running around on house walls and roofs and you are you can turn into a monster off and on and be a normal guy. I forgot the name of it. It wasn't a particularly well game, but it started out with you having all the features that you would gain through the game and then you lost all of it when you get got to level two. So you actually had a promise of what to gain and then you lost everything and had to sort of move up. And, and, and the feeling of loss was, uh, was notable. Um, yes. I, I, I'm thinking about, did you come up with any kind of rules for progression systems? You sort of lo looked into, we want to look into progression systems because I think progression, whether it is in, in teaching or in games or, in, or in, a, in a theater play or film, it's always super duper difficult. So I'm, I was uh, wondering, I mean, super duper, it's like the US, they have these super duper bombs. We can have super duper discussions here. Sorry, it's such a stupid word. But I'm, I'm thinking about, did you come up with the kind of the rule of progression is? That would be interesting. Did you find out about progression systems? In, well, I, I can say as much as, uh, I was, I was maybe, maybe the programmer, so this might not be super representative of the designers great work on this, but uh, as far as I could understand, a lot of the uh, research that was being done was mostly coming up with like tech trees, this is like in civilization. So uh, most of the, like most of the, of the considerations on progression came from, of course, that, but also our own experiences with, with, with these types of games and kind of the intuition that comes from that. Uh, if that answers your question. I'm not sure I understood entirely, but <laughs> I'm not sure it does either because it, it's it's such an interesting question. And again, I think the, the power of the university is actually asking these questions. When you're sitting in a company like IO Interactive or Square Enix, where I was sitting, and we were looking at tons of different games, progression was one of the things because, as I think uh, Mass said earlier today, he said, you know, making a game super hard is not that difficult, but actually making it having a nice and development, and it feels great that it sort of becomes worse and worse, and and still fulfilling. That's that's the trick. Yes. And that's. I think I, again saying that we are actually taking people's lifetime, so let's honor that with respect. I think it's a super interesting, and if I was head of a company, I would definitely spend you know money on that to say go and find out about this progression thing because we we all fighting with it and, and and I would like to understand what are all the parameters and how do they interfere each other because some of these things you can let leave has a higher impact and others has low impact and it could be super interesting to develop a language uh, yes. if, if, if one could do that. Absolutely that is the plan moving forward. <laughs> I look forward to see what you come up with I think it's super interesting thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Thanks for everybody thank, for listening. Thank you both and just to um, to add a little more um, praise on them, they have already defended this project, so I don't <laughs> need to hold back on that. But this was only one of three projects they came up with when we were talking about what they wanted to do uh, as a semester project. And they were all three amazing. So um, they just need more time to realize their very wacky and cool ideas. So. With that, we're coming to our last project of the night, and we actually are going to end with a theoretical framework that has the potential of tying all of this stuff together that we are exploring here. Um, Jonathan is going to talk about his very ambitious project that he called Untangling the Knot, a visual dialogical model for analyzing role-playing game interactions, and that is uh, a big one. So Jonathan, please enlighten us. Oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do my best and see if I uh, do the premise justice. Okay, I'll start sharing my screen. Hi, my name is Jonathan. Uh, pleasure to be t talking to you about this. So uh, my model here is not as flashy. It's called uh, the Visual Dialogical Model. Uh, uh, the project is Untangling the Knot. This is the model. So what is this? 
um, uh, what is the not that I'm talking about? And that is that um, role playing, uh, tabletop role playing game definitions and models are um, in academic circles needlessly restrictive. Um, some talk about the need for a certain facilitator, an adjudicator, or different responsibilities. Um, but what, uh, what if we instead look at the interactions that are present between all tabletop role-playing games? So uh, in playing a role-playing game, there'll be differences between the rules as they are written in the text and the lived experience around the table. The rules, they always need to be reinterpreted. So instead of checking whom makes an arbitration or an interpretation, um, but just if there has been one, it is possible to look at both the rules are separate from play and in play situations. So um, what the hell are we doing? Um, so this process of adjusting our expectation about what takes place in an imagined space is what I would call the process of attenuation with one another or with one's own self in confrontation with the text. So this happens when it's a game in a situation governed by a set of rules and it happens with multiple people people in these situations. The, uh, it's role play. Um, and the reason why I have these two very different pictures um, is because the top one is from a participatory performance by Nina Rune Essendrop, um, where there's also multiple people, an adjustment of expectations, a process of attenuation, and it's governed by a set of rules. But it's not around a table as below. So maybe the breadth of this model is larger than originally thought. Um, right. So the model itself, uh, we have a lot of cover. Uh, this, the arrows represent what is what I call the flow of information. Um, it is any form of information. It's any form of communication, real or imagined, both from participant to participant and from text or medium to a participant by words, uh, by miming, anything goes right. This little fella is the sign meaning participant adjudication. That is when a participant makes a choice or interpretation of, the, of anything, um, yeah, either singular or as a group um, between players. This is the shared imagined space, this little cloud that you have in your head. Um, it means that the game world is confirmed when this is shown. So there's this weird concept of a shared imagined space and well, we all imagine the situation differently, but when the qualities that you imagine um, are reified and confirmed to exist in another person's imagination through a form of communication, then um, th that is the shared imagined space that has just been confirmed. So this would be role play, but not a role playing game. If, I, if, you, if you do me the honors of closing your eyes and I say the hall is spacious and cold, some of you will probably have an image right now of a hall that is spacious and some form of uh, iciness, then you would maybe ask, well, if there's ice, is the floor slippery? So when I say something about the game world, that is me, in, me making a statement about it, then you asking me about is the floor slippery, then you're bringing the choice back to me and I'll make a choice. Well, yes, it is slippery. And suddenly we have reestablished the, the the shared imagined space, right? But it's not a role-playing game because they need interpreted mechanics. So interpreted mechanics, they are these kind of norms. They are spacious halls with ice. That's a norm um, in the world uh, with, with a bounded verifiable procedure that guides the interaction, including what should take place physically around where you are. So uh, you must mime your answers, <laughs> uh, the scope of actions. Um, what may a participant change in the game world? So um, what happens when you step on ice? And modes, how may the participant iterate the game world? Can you say that there is no ice? Um, if you are the ice king, you may say there is no ice. OK, that's a mode. Um, so this is the entirety of the model. Now let's get down to business, because I just want to show you how it works uh, functionally. Um, right. So this game to the right is Archipelago. Uh, a game with, uh, where sh with shared responsibilities between players, uh, a storytelling game, uh, really recommend it. It's, called, it's by Mattis Holder. The third version came out in 2012. In that game, 
the players activate rules by speaking certain phrases. So when you activate a rule by speaking a phrase, that will be you choosing to do something from the rules body. So by saying the specific phrase harder, I may force the other participant to intensify their description of the event, not revoking what has been said, but they must amp up. So that has an effect on the game world. And instead I can say, try a different way. Then I would request of the other um, that I want the event to proceed differently, revoking what has been said. So now the other player has to make a choice. Again, they are in interpreting my uh, request, which is the second phase there before they make any decision about the imagined space. But there's a variant of the rule, and that is that they may specify, I may specify by saying, try a different way, I don't like icy floors. Um, and that forces the, uh, forces the other player to interpret the quest before saying something with impact on the game world. So that means that they would also have to attenuate with me in what way do you, do, do you not want it? And that would create a dialogue before the shared imagined space can be uh, reified. Cool. So that is how it works in, in uh, functionally. I have a lot more examples, but I won't cover them here. Um, so what does this mean? Now I'm probably drawing a, a lot of lines like a conspiracy theorist. Um, but by analyzing different systems and situations, specific patterns sort of reveal themselves. Um, for example, you can count the amount of interactions or the amount of, the amount of times uh, the flow of information goes between players before reaching the imagined space to sort of see if there's um, uh, to see if there's certain effects, right? Like uh, crunchy synthesis systems may have a lot more of that going on before the imagined space is reestablished. And, and uh, analyzing different means of communication, miming versus speech, creates certain structures that have like if certain effects on the experience. So uh, future prospects and developments of the model is that I found out now after I've used it more that it's more than the information is more than just information so the arrows key together with when with with the different uh, parts of the model the interpreted mechanics for example when when it flows from a player to an interpreted mechanic well that most likely means specific things so the model uh, model has changed a little since then it still the still the same elements but now they're grouped differently and I've been using the model out of a tabletop role-playing context to, to look briefly at Nina Rune Essendorp's play, which is the one to the top right, about, um, uh, about uh, the, it's called the human experience, where players, uh, participants are either these entities that go into human bodies and have to experience what it is to have a sensory body and the other players or participants or audience members, because it's not a role-playing game, it's a participatory performance must help them find out what it is to be a human and there are rules introduced in the workshop. So here the text body is not a text, but it's verbal, but they are still very much these kind of interpretive mechanics that do not only contain norms. And I I've, I've want to use it for co-design because I've only been using it for my own designs. And lastly, I would like to say that because the granularity is very high and you can analyze every rule uh, and every instance of play both within the text and in play, uh, down to bits, the model is very time intensive and time consuming to use. So that's one of the downsides um, or features, uh, however you want to put it. Anyways, um, oh, by the way, last thing, the reason why the harbinger fish is there is because that's an instance of speculative design that is also having a shared imagined space and rules, but it's presented differently. And that, that specific piece is by Cecil Abrahamson and uh, Dauma Biele Mildas um, about a fish that uh, is, is a symbiotic creature between, um, uh, between uh, garbage and uh, biostructure. Uh, and it proposes a different future and that's the shared imagined space. So I want to broaden the prospects of, of, of the model. And so far it's been uh, enlightening. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Jonathan for enlightening us or sharing your enlightenment with us. Um, I want to stop the sharing uh, and yes. my mouse has just died. <laughs> that I, is great. Um, I think we can do that an hour and I okay. think uh, we can manage that. Thomas. Yeah. Done. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. It's uh, 
It's a, it's a super interesting presentation, especially when thinking about the one Sebastian held a little ago. Uh, you're sort of like into the whole perception of reality and perception of especially shared reality. And I think in, in, in working with theater, I often had the problem, you know, what does it mean? Because it means something different to gender, to cultural background, to, I mean, we, we discussed earlier that what does play mean? What does fun mean? And this whole discussion about the, the root of the word and, and the shared, you know, understanding. So when you begin to think about, I, I think you become what's called uh, a little bit uh, thankful about all the, um, the approximations we accept every day because otherwise we couldn't talk together. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and being married for the almost 40 years, I think this is, it's also always the interpretation that hits you and never what's actually been said. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine when I started this, that the model could be used for couple, couples therapy, but um, yeah. It can, it can. Um, and, and how you treat your kids, because how they interpret a rule, when to eat the cookies and when not, I mm. mean. I, I think I think again. I, I would use this as a kind of uh, also a creative work when you're sitting and working with something and you sort of read some model. You think this is perfect, and you you sometimes need someone to either kick your balls or kick your text or kick something mm -hmm. because you need to rethink it. Because as Socrates said, you know, the more you know about things, the more you realize you don't know, and you can't know, and you can never know. Do you mean in regards to the shared space? Or do you yeah, mean in, exactly? In, and when I try to communicate, I try to say mm -hmm. something to you, and you say yes, yes, sure. But how can I be sure that you understood actually what I said? Because mm -hmm. I'm not even sure that I understand. You know, the simplest word, ice cream or a dog or something, because it actually opens for a lot of interpretations. And and yet, as as you said, the interpretation space can be really wide. And I see this as also and another thing, just to give you another prospect, the leadership. I mean, in, in whole leadership principle is about communicating and how how to lead people into understanding where the company is going. You know, we are, we're a bigger group of people. How do we get to that point? And and sometimes you need, on one hand, you need it to be quite, uh, quite clear. On the other hand, you need people's potential to fill it. So that's, again, again this duality between control and chaos and clarity and, and open for interpretation. And, and I, I don't have such questions because I think we're ending out of time. I just said, I think it's, it has a lot of potential what you've been doing. I'm not sure I understood all of it, but I, I, I think it opens for, as I said, uh, work when you creatively want to rethink what you're doing. Uh, you can ask these questions. They, they work really well to sort of go back and take another dive into the work. And, and the other stuff is how to lead people because people interpret things you know, as the wind blows. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It was interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to both of you for your final uh, slight mind expansion and uh, you know, pointing us back to that play in the end is just a, a bundle of social constructs and conventions, maybe. I'm sure that Miguel doesn't have an itchy finger now to uh, take the microphone and elucidate us on what play is. I want to thank all five presenters of this last panel, all the people sticking around on Twitch, still watching us, and especially Thomas Howard for giving us his time. This was uh, wonderful, if a little tiring, and uh, I want to say goodbye for tonight, but uh, Martin Pichelmeyer, our head of program and the organizer of this whole thing, wants to say uh, some final words. So I say peace out, uh, Martin, it's your turn. Yes, hello again. I also just want to say goodbye and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, a pleasure to have you. Uh, and I think your comments were better than a lot of questions I have heard in my life. Um, <laughs> so, uh, thanks to all the presenters, not only the last uh, uh, five, yeah, five we had here in this session, but over the whole session, uh, 20 super exciting presentations for me. I have to say that like I knew most of the projects, but somehow now I want to play them. Uh, even those that I have already played, I want to play them again because it's like it's you really did a good job at um, at kind of uh, carving out the interesting details and just formulating what it is actually about and what you were actually thinking about them. And that is always 
uh, that always makes things for me exciting because then it also, I don't know, gives me a little bit of uh, your worldview and I can learn so much from that. And I have learned things today. Um, so thanks also to the audience. Uh, thanks to all my colleagues who have been uh, so nice to moderate all these sessions and help out in so many regards. Thanks to the student helpers. Uh, a special shout out to uh, uh, Alex for uh, handling the chat in uh, Twitch so nicely. Uh, it was really a very, very nice space you created there. Um, and that is it from me. Uh, I'm, I'm inclined to say that we should just do that again next year. Uh, instead of just having these uh, boring exhibitions uh, here on site where only the locals can join uh, and have to take a lot of time instead of just sitting there and uh, tuning in. Uh, but uh, we will, should definitely keep this channel alive and host more events on Twitch because I actually totally enjoy this. And thank you all for coming. And this is it from me.